Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to ACNS webinar. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from Italy, Dr. Cesare Zoya. Dr. Zoya is a member of the medical staff of neurosurgery unit of Foundation IRCCS Policlinico San Matteo, Pavia, Italy. He has a PhD diploma in surgery and surgical biotechnology, and his clinical activities focus mainly on skull based endoscopic surgery. He was nominated in the ENS uh, Young Neurosurgeons Committee and he has participated as a tu teacher, tutor in many national and international courses mainly on endoscopic skull based surgeries. He is an noted author with several publications in various peer reviewed journals and we are extremely honored to have him today at webinars and today he will be sharing his experience about endoscopic transorbital surgeries. The speaker for the second session is our honored guest from Ecuador, Professor Brian Salazar. He is a tenured professor of neurology and neurosurgery for undergraduate and postgraduate studies at San Francisco de Quito University. He is also the postgraduate professor of, of orthopedics and traumatology at the Central University of Ecuador. And he was a previous fellow in the skull based surgery and microsurgery at the Will Connell Medical College, USA. He is a leader of neurosurgery service of the Armed Forces Hospital, Quito, Ecuador, and also a neurosurgery attending physician at the Hospital Metropolitano. He is an active member of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and the President of the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today at webinars and today he will be talking about basic surgical principles and techniques in meningioma surgery. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is an honored guest from Korea, Professor Do Sik Kong. Professor Kong is a professor of neurosurgery at the Samsung Medical Center, Sung Kyung Kwon University, Seoul, South Korea. Dr. Kong per performs the innovative surgical techniques including endoscopic endonasal and transorbital surgery for complex brain tumors and image guided keyhole endoscopic and microscopic surgeries. Dr. Kong is now an active member and the president of the Korean Society of Endoscopic Neurosurgery. His research work has focused on the development of innovative and novel skull based and endoscopic approaches. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues from China, and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co host for today. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this podium to our first chair, Professor Du Sik Kong. I'm going to start. And I'm Tushikong from Seoul. Pleasure to moderate Dr. Joya's lectures on the endoscopic trends of the surgery for skull lesions in ACS webinar sessions. Briefly, I'm going to introduce endoscopic trends of the surgery, new field of surgery, with the first reports developing less than 15 years ago by Dr. Chris Moore. The report is due to the borderline of traditional surgical limit by ENT doctors neurosurgeons, and oculoplastic surgeons. For example, ophthalmologists concerned the pathologists within the orbit, ENT doctors, median and infant neurosurgeons, neurofosa above the orbit. Introduction of technologies such as the endoscope and shaders and the expansion of our techniques such as the endoscope to provide the print for multidisciplinary corrections for advances in these novel approaches. Today, we're going to ask a lecture to Seja Joyer, one of the famous endoscopic skull based surgeons from Pavia, Italy. Dr. Joyer, are you ready? Thank you, Professor, for your kind introduction. I, I hope that uh, we can discuss a little bit about this uh, wonderful approach that this has been developed, as you said, in the last years, but has a, a quite long history. I will uh, show you uh, in my presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. I'm Cesare Zoya. I work in Pavia, as said, in the north of Italy. And uh, my um, focus is uh, on endoscopic uh, skull base uh, uh, approaches. And uh, of course, in the last year, also on transorbital one, because uh, it's going to be developed in the last uh, few years, as said. I have uh, no uh, potential conflict of interest to report, and uh, I will uh, uh, share my uh, brief experience on this uh, approach. I want to start with this photo. This is uh, uh, Professor Jacopo Dallan, an ENT guy from Italy, from uh, Tuscany. 
that uh, has worked with me in Varese with uh, Professor Castelnuovo that everybody knows uh, as the leader in endoscopic skull base surgery uh, and uh, was the first that uh, tell us, uh, report uh, to us this kind of approach. It was uh, 2010 and uh, it said to us, uh, let's try to go with the endoscope through the orbit. And everybody was laughing and saying, oh, it's not possible, it's not a good thing. But I have to say that uh, it was right. It was, uh, 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 it is a very interesting approach and very useful in such, uh, in specific uh, cases. So I want to thank you uh, once again, uh, Jacopo, to uh, have uh, spread the voice of this uh, uh, approach in Italy. As you know, Orbit uh, is uh, uh, borderland uh, and many specialists could approach orbital pathology. Neurosurgeon, maxillofacial surgeon, ophthalmologist, and also, of course, ENTs. And uh, the orbit can be considered uh, as a target per se, or also uh, we, 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 we will see later also with, uh, uh, as an access route. As, and uh, the, the work, the tremendous work of Professor Dossi Kong uh, demonstrated it very, very, very well. Uh, as a target, of course, we can divide it in intraconal and extraconal spaces. And in both of spaces, there are a lot of different uh, rare, because uh, all, all the pathology in the orbit are quite rare pathologies, from inflammatory to neoplastic to vascular. Uh, to a lacrimal gland and so on. But uh, orbital surgery has a long, long history. And uh, just in the last uh, decade, uh, the endoscope came into the field. Uh, we have to uh, citate uh, Cronline, of course, because it developed this, uh, the approach, the, the, the approach of, to, to the lab that are part of the orbit that, that, that is also nowadays uh, used. Uh, you can see the, the original skin incision, maybe it's not the most aesthetic possible, but uh, this is the, the original work of uh, Cronline. Uh, but uh, during the times, uh, the orbit was approached, of course, also from transcranial approach, especially in the 40s, yes, was developed the approach from, uh, from above. And uh, we have also to state uh, uh, Professor Akuba that develops the frontal or temporal orbital zygomatic approach in the 80s. And also this approach can be used uh, to, to operate orbital uh, pathologies. But uh, we all know that this kind of uh, skull, big skull-based approach are uh, quite invasive. And uh, nowadays we are searching for minimal invasive or uh, uh, not so invasive approach. And uh, the endoscope came to the field uh, and we have to learn from our ENT uh, colleagues that uh, start to uh, manage orbital pathology or border pathology between orbit and nose, uh, like uh, the, the problem of the uh, uh, lacrimal uh, pathway uh, and with the dacryocystal rhinostomy endoscopic one and they start to uh, go from medially to laterally toward the orbit and this was uh, uh, in the late 80s uh, at the beginning of the uh, 90s and uh, after that uh, of course a lot of publication came out uh, and uh, uh, the, the scientific uh, uh, world understand that uh, orbit can be managed with an endoscopic approach uh, in that period, just through the nose. And uh, after that, uh, of course, uh, uh, we start to think that uh, the endonasal endoscopic approach could manage some pathology of the orbit, of course, of the medial part of the orbit, 
uh, we have to remember the the gold stand the gold rule of uh, some do not cross the nerve and in this case the optic nerve is our border and uh, the endoscopic tran transnasal orbital decompression for basid of disease was developed here you can see an example of an easy operation that gives a lot of benefit to the patient that cannot uh, 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 get that have pro proptosis and uh, the quality of life of this patient uh, gain a lot from this uh, simple operation. Of course, you have to remove uh, the ethmoidal part uh, and then just to cut the periorbit. We are we are we are now at the border. Going ahead, uh, we have to consider that. Uh, uh, ENTs start to treat orbital pathology, uh, uh, intraorbital tumors or vascular pathology like hemangioma uh, in, the, in the 90s. And uh, at the beginning, just extraconal and then also intraconal uh, pathology. Here are some reports of uh, di different uh, famous uh, ENT groups. And uh, it's... Uh, possible with respecting uh, uh, all the nasal structure, just uh, uh, removing the uncinate process and the bulla pose uh, a small part of the period of the orbit, uh, orbital wall, and to remove uh, the papyracea and uh, uh, just to in inside, uh, just to cut uh, the periorbit and respecting all the muscle of the, the rectus muscle, especially the medium, the medial and the inferior one, uh, you, it, it is uh, possible to uh, treat some intraconal uh, pathology. Like in this case, you see an hemangioma that is uh, nasalized, as, uh, as if you want, if you want to say this, this new word, and uh, then uh, cauterized and uh, take it take taken out. Uh, after that, of course, uh, we can reach uh, uh, the, the limit of uh, our medial approach, and uh, it is possible also to treat uh, uh, pathology that goes uh, uh, from medial to the optic nerve. Here you can see another example of uh, hemangioma, but here you can see uh, an optic nerve sheet meningioma treated endoscopically. And so we have we start from the, the border, from the medial wall of the orbit, we reach the, uh, the optic nerve. Of course, this, in this case, the, the goal of the surge is just a decompression. And the, the patient is already blind because you see the, the MR, it's uh, a huge uh, optic nerve sheet meningioma. But uh, it's possible with, the, of course, angle scope, manage also this pathology. And of course, uh, you have uh, also to close uh, the medial uh, wall of the orbit, but uh, closing is not a, a big deal in most of the cases. It's just a little bit of hemostatic agent and uh, some uh, fibrin glue. Uh, but we all know that the pathology can be also in the lateral part of the orbit. And this is the region, the reason because uh, the transorbital uh, approach was uh, developed. Uh, we know that uh, it can, the, the lateral part of the orbit can be approached superiorly through a superior eyelid or eyebrow. I put this word here, but I will uh, explain it later. Uh, through a lateral retrocantal approach, I have no experience in this particular uh, kind of transorbital approach, and through an inferior eyelid approach. It depends, of, of course, if the pathology is in the superior or the inferior quadrant, lateral quadrant of the orbit. Uh, the history uh, of this kind of uh, approach, of the transorbital endoscopic uh, approach, uh, it's... Uh, as, as my age, because I was born in 1981, and the first report of endoscopic orbital surgery was by John Norris from San Francisco uh, in that uh, in that years. But uh, in after just after 30 years, we can say with the work of Mo and uh, the Italian uh, of uh, 
the, the, the works of uh, some uh, Italian uh, guys like uh, Professor Castelnuovo, Dr. Professor Locatelli, uh, Dr. Dallana, uh, Matteo De Notaris, uh, Alberto Di Soma, and so on. It became more, more popular in the recent, uh, recent year. Uh, here we have uh, the first report of uh, the group of uh, Varese uh, that uh, uh, shows uh, their experience through a, through a superior uh, eye lead endoscopic assist management of infraorbital uh, lesion. And uh, as you can see, it uh, was uh, from uh, 2016. Uh, I, I will show now uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, explanation of this uh, uh, approach, just to show everybody uh, how can uh, be done this approach and uh, uh, all the uh, target that we can reach. Of course, we start uh, uh, with, with a, a dissection of the periorbita. Uh, the, the skin part, uh, I, will, uh, I will come back to the skin part later. Uh, the dissection, uh, the periorbital is detached from the lateral wall and the lateral aspect of the roof of the orbit. And uh, I just, uh, it, it is mesialized uh, to, uh, uh, with a spatula, but not a fixed one, because it's not necessary uh, that uh, have a fixed spatula. Then the zygomatic temporal artery and nerve are identified and the superior aspect of the lateral orbital wall, as you can see in the figure B, and uh, the zygomatic uh, temporal bundle is cut. And the, for, uh, the hirt foramen is uh, uh, most of the time uh, visualized. If you go uh, uh, posteriorly, you will reach uh, the great uh, sphenoidal wing and uh, the superior orbital fissure. After that, you can uh, expose uh, the, bony, the bone of the great uh, sphenoidal wing and uh, uh, you can uh, put your spatula in the, uh, in the sagittal crest, that is a structure that uh, will be created with the drilling of the bone. Uh, the lateral wall of the orbit is totally drilled uh, out and uh, the temporalis muscle and fascia are exposed. Uh, and so the, the, the temporal muscle and the superior orbital fissure with the uh, uh, sphenoid wings represent the, the shape of the, our craniectomy. After the drilling of the, the sphenoidal wing, uh, the dura mater of the temporal pole, so the middle cranial fossa is, expo is exposed. If uh, it is necessary, of course, uh, it can be exposed also the dura mater of the anterior cranial fossa, uh, just drilling out the superior uh, wall of the orbit. Uh, if, it, it, just to understand where we are, you, you see in, uh, in red a circle uh, that is the projection of the McCarthy KO that is more familiar for all neurosurgeons. Uh, after uh, uh, drilling uh, out and flatten uh, the bone, it is possible extradurally to expose, uh, for example, the trigeminal uh, V3 uh, and uh, to uh, go more posteriorly in the mid-cranial fossa. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this kind of, of approach at least in cadavers, but also in surgery, uh, as uh, Professor Dusikong has uh, well demonstrated, is very, very useful to approach uh, the cavernous sinus. And uh, uh, as you can see in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the pictures, uh, it is possible to separate the two layers of, uh, um, of the dura and to expose the lateral wall of the, the cavernous sinus uh, with the third, the fourth, v, v, uh, V1 and V2, uh, uh, that is more inferior, of course. Uh, the first structure is identified as commonly V1 because it's bigger, but uh, above it, you can uh, easily uh, see uh, the third and the fourth cranial nerves. 
uh, after after that uh, of, of, of course uh, uh, it is possible also to open the dura and to uh, at least in this uh, cadaveric uh, uh, dissection uh, going intradurally and see also the carotid in the intracavernous portion of the carotid and uh, the nerves that we have uh, described uh, before. Uh, through uh, a transorbital approach, it's, all, it's also uh, have a very good view of the Sylvian fissure from a different perspective, uh, not the standard neurosurgical opening of the Sylvian fissure, but from uh, uh, the front. And uh, it is uh, possible to identify the different branches of the um, middle cerebral artery and also to uh, see the temporal um, the temporal pole, the frontal lobe, uh, limen insula, and so on. So uh, it, has been, it has been described also that it is possible uh, to reach uh, the deeper uh, uh, cerebral areas through the orbit. And uh, at, at the end, uh, it is possible also to reach the posterior fossa, and of course, uh, it's, uh, you have to go posteriorly. Uh, you have to identify the uh, middle meningeal artery between V2 and uh, to drill out uh, the, um, uh, the Cavase triangle, exposing the posterior fossa dura. Uh, of course, uh, it, this is uh, just a cadaveric dissection. Uh, in, uh, in vivo, it's more, more difficult and the indication should be uh, discussed uh, with, uh, with the, the scientific community. And uh, I will uh, return to the scheme. I, I think that uh, it's easy to see with these two pictures that not all the schemes are the same and uh, also not all the eyebrows are the same. And so uh, we, we started uh, uh, discussing about the skin incision and uh, we, we just uh, thought that uh, neurosurgeons are quite familiar with uh, an eyebrow incision and uh, that is used for, uh, for example, uh, uh, supra, supraorbital uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, approach. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, we have demonstrated that through this incision is possible, of course, to go in supraorbital, but also to uh, easily assess the orbit uh, without even uh, uh, dissecting the superior levator palpebrae that can be a risky point uh, with uh, an eye lead incision. Uh, you can see it's the same uh, uh, cadaveric preparation and uh, uh, with an endoscope through a supraorbital, uh, you can reach uh, the deeper uh, intracranial structure like the chiasm and the uh, anterior communicating complex. And with uh, with a transorbital, uh, you can drill out all the sphenoid wings. So here also the uh, anterior cranial fossa is exposed and you can reach uh, the target that we have uh, seen before. So we publish our experience uh, um, of endoscopic transorbital surgery with uh, this uh, kind of in incision. And this is the original video of the, this uh, kind of pathology was a fibromyxoid sarcoma of the lateral wall of the orbit. You can see the pre and the post-op uh, MR. And you can see that uh, uh, it's uh, a five minute or less approach because you are directly in the lateral wall of the orbit and you can uh, easily manage uh, uh, the pathology, uh, expose the dura of the anterior and the middle cranial fossa. It's not, in this case, was not necessary to uh, go in, inside the dura, but uh, the patient goes well and with, without deficit. This is another uh, example of uh, transorbital endoscopic uh, approach for orbital pathology. You see the pre and the post-op was uh, an ectopic uh, meningioma of the orbital apus, uh, not uh, very big, but uh, you can reach the point uh, 
to cut the periorbita just above the lesion, of course, with the help of neural navigation, and you can uh, uh, manage the, this uh, kind of lesion and also the capsule through this uh, kind of approach. As said, the closure, if the dura is not opening, is straightforward, just a little bit of fibrin glue, and the aesthetic results, especially in cases uh, where the eyebrow is like that, are very, very satisfactory. Uh, as said, uh, there is not just not the superior part of the orbit that can be affected by pathology, but also the inferior part. For the inferior uh, lateral quadrant, we prefer to use a, a trans-inferior uh, eyelid approach. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, an example of uh, uh, an hemangioma treated with this uh, uh, kind of approach. Uh, the, the, the concepts are the same. You have to reach the orbital rim and then to dissect uh, the periorbit uh, and to uh, medialize, in this case, to uh, push it uh, a little bit superiorly just to uh, uh, find the lesion. Of course, you have to respect uh, the muscle to prevent diplopia and you have to uh, try to avoid uh, bleeding that can be easily managed, of course, with uh, some hemostatic agent, but uh, it's uh, very important to prevent uh, uh, post-operative uh, hematomas and uh, other complications. Here you can see the, 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 the periorbit and the muscle that are uh, exposed, and then just a, a, a little bit of retraction of our spatula, and the lesion came into the field. Uh, Quite, it's a quite big, so bigger the lesion, easier the operation, in my, in my opinion, because sometimes the lesion is not so big. In the orbit, uh, you can get lost, and uh, it's not always so easy to find uh, your, your target. In this case, it was just uh, uh, pushing a little bit behind some cottonoids, the lesion came out and was uh, easy to uh, remove. Uh, I will spend a, 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 a couple of words uh, in, in, in closure because uh, we, we start to closure like every operation with, with a suture, but uh, uh, we, we just uh, uh, passed and uh, we just nowadays we use just uh, uh, glue, uh, skin glue that is very, very aesthetic. And there's no, absolutely no, no, no problems. Here you can see some hemostatic agent at the end of the, of the operation and have some fibrin glue inside. And then um, I will skip a little bit uh, the. The video just to go to the end. And this is the result. This is the post-operative uh, day, you can see a little bit of uh, bleeding and a little bit of chemosis of the uh, uh, skin, but in a few days, uh, it, everything goes well. Uh, as uh, we have said, uh, the orbit can, uh, can represent a very useful also access route. Of course, uh, uh, every portion of the, the, the skull can be reached, anterior, middle, and ca cranial fossa, cavernous sinus, and posterior cranial fossa. Uh, also, uh, the various group has published uh, some uh, papers about uh, the possibility to go through the dura uh, with this kind of uh, pathology. But nowadays, a lot of work has been done, and uh, uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Professor Dossicon, who is one of the leaders of uh, the transorbital approach uh, behind the orbital content. and. Uh, uh, in uh, infracranial pathology. Here, uh, here we have uh, a small uh, example of uh, a, a sphenoid wing meningioma, sphenoorbital one, uh, that uh, has a big bony uh, part that uh, goes into the orbit and a small part that uh, goes infracranially. Uh, as you can see, the, the bony works is always uh, the, the first. You have to expose uh, uh, your uh, dura, but uh, it's quite uh, uh, 
straightforward uh, approach for this kind of pathology. And after you expose the dura, you have converted this kind of meningioma in a convex meningioma. You can just cauterize the dura and cut the dura around the meningioma and take away the, the pathology. And at the end, you have the vision of the Sylvian fissure that we have seen before in the uh, uh, cadaveric dissection. You can see the, the, the video of the operation. The infracranial part is not so big, but can be uh, quite easily managed. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, the closure, uh, you have to pay attention a little bit more to the closure because you open the dura, but uh, it is possible to uh, make a duraplasty uh, with some uh, heterologous uh, materials also autologous if you want, uh, and uh, the effect of the orbit and the orbit itself helps, helps a lot to uh, push a little bit the material and to prevent fistula. Uh, we have published this commentary. Uh, I, I will, I will uh, sh share with you this, this, this uh, commentary because uh, the, the original article was uh, a very important article for this kind of uh, approach because uh, described for the first time the sagittal crest. It's a work for a friend of mine, of uh, Matteo De Notaris. And uh, I think it's uh, an important uh, milestone in this kind of approach. Uh, but uh, we have uh, just... Uh, right and we think that uh, uh, for purely intracranial pathologies uh, this kind of approach should be uh, validated as uh, as uh, it, it is normal i think that new when, when there is a new approach uh, should be stressed a lot but the real benefit uh, of all uh, this kind of uh, approaches uh, has to be demonstrated of course, uh, uh, Professor Dossi Kong has already done uh, uh, a tremendous job uh, in this direction, but uh, it has to be spread and uh, became uh, familiar in, in a lot of centers to be uh, sure that it is uh, a valid option for purely intracranial pathology. It can be done, but we have not to uh, forget that uh, there are uh, also traditional uh, transcranial approach that can be uh, also useful. Uh, this is uh, our series. Uh, we started quite recently and it's not a big one, but uh, we have uh, uh, the indication are quite uh, uh, strict. And you can see uh, we, we use the endoscopic endonasal and endoscopic transorbital approach half and half. And of course, it's possible to combine uh, this kind of uh, approaches because uh, uh, the multi-portal, uh, uh, so-called multi-portal endoscopic approach to the skull base, it's uh, uh, very useful in uh, some kind of uh, uh, pathologies. Uh, it is important to, to underline that there are also complications, not a, a totally free of complication approach. Most of them are not so important, like periorbital eyelid or edema or periorbital hematoma. And they go well uh, every time. It, it takes a little bit to recover maybe, but uh, are not big stuff. But we have to say that also in our small seer, we have a couple of um, bad complications like cerebral abscess and a permanent diplopia due to the manipulation of the, of the muscle and due to, of course, uh, an infection. Um, this is uh, my personal series of transorbital endoscopic approach. I said not so big, but we, we, we use that just for pathology that is in the orbit or that goes in the orbit from this phenoid region. Uh, of course, I will. Uh, I, I started also after uh, seeing the work of Professor Dossi Kong and others uh, to use this uh, uh, approach for just uh, intracranial uh, pathology, but uh, I, I'm uh, at the beginning of this step. And so uh, my results are not uh, 
uh, ready uh, now to share. And uh, I want to uh, go to, to, to the end uh, with some tips and tricks, very easy things, but I think that uh, uh, some easy things can be useful for someone that uh, wants to start with this kind of uh, surgery. Uh, it's always, uh, most, in most of the cases, uh, a lot of the cases when the pathologist is in the orbit or uh, goes into the orbit, the patient has a proptosis. And so it's, it's very important during the operation to close the eyes. Uh, it is possible also to suture the, the, pulp, the, the, the eyelid, but we prefer to use uh, sterile strips. And then you can forget it because uh, if during the surgery, uh, the eyes remains open or partially open, you can have bad uh, complication. Uh, and it is, uh, it is not, uh, uh, this is not a, a good thing, of course. Of course, if you put your incision, it just a uh, question, we can debate about that on the eyebrow or just below the eyebrow, of course, you have to respect and the direction and the angle of the eyebrow hair, because uh, in, in, uh, in, on the contrary, uh, the, the aesthetic results will be very, very bad. Of course, if you use a trans, a purely trans eyelid approach, uh, the incision will be uh, covered uh, when the eye is open. And uh, another small trick is uh, just put uh, eyes on the skin, immediately post-operative to avoid uh, edema and to avoid the periorbital hematoma. As said, uh, we, we use a fabric glue for closure. In this uh, quite uh, old operation, we, we have cut also the eyebrow. It's not necessary at all, but uh, it's just to show you that uh, after a couple of months, uh, the incision is uh, practically you cannot see where it is and to uh, give some conclusion but more than conclusion are point to, to, to debate points to debate because I think in this kind of approach uh, nothing is uh, concluded it is uh, a, a work in progress and uh, different group in the world uh, have uh, uh, Give, have given the, the contribution and it's very important to uh, collect data and to publish uh, solid uh, evidence uh, to support this kind of approach. And uh, I think it is possible to have access to every portion of the orbit through endoscopic approach, the medial portion through transnasal and the lateral portion through transorbital. The orbit, of course, can become an asset corridor for the anterior, the middle, and maybe also the posterior carrier base. But remember that there are also standard uh, approaches that can be used. Endoscopic approaches correlated with a lower number of complications than a traditional approach uh, with osteotomies for orbital pathology, for example, the crown line. And uh, the use of all the technology intraoperative imaging, navigation, inst advanced instruments uh, can, of course, uh, reduce uh, the, the complication. And I think nowadays it's mandatory to use all the technology that can be used. Of course, it is uh, necessary to have uh, high specialized staff in endoscopic surgery. You cannot start just, uh, okay, uh, you have put an endoscope in the orbit and I go through the dura just because uh, I think it's cool. No, you have to start from basic procedure and uh, step by step goes to the most difficult one. And uh, the multidisciplinary collaboration, it's in my opinion, especially between ENT and neurosurgeon, but also with other uh, specialty mandatory. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm not finished yet, but uh, I want to give you uh, my contact, uh, my social uh, uh, contact, just to keep in touch for everyone that wants to whatever question or wants to visit us at our clinic or want to join our courses. Because I think that uh, if uh, you want to start this kind of uh, 
uh, pathology and uh, to approach this kind of pathology and to use the endoscope, you have to start with courses. This is an example of the first ever hybrid courses. Uh, hybrid because we start the first day with a simulation, a simulator, and then we repeat the same procedure on the cadaver the second day. We have seen and we are going to publish that uh, the learning curve uh, goes very, very, uh, goes high very fast uh, with this kind of approach. We will, uh, as I said, we will perform uh, surgical, the surgical procedure two times uh, in two different days with a, simula a simulator and a cadaver. Here you can see some picture of the last uh, courses. And uh, uh, this is a brief video of what uh, we have done and what we will repeat uh, in the next uh, mass. You can scan easily the QR code to uh, see uh, our courses. And uh, I think as said, we have to use all the technology during the operation, but it's very, very important to use all the technology that we can have nowadays, also in the courses, in the pre-op and uh, in the uh, training. Because uh, if some years ago, uh, the learning curve takes uh, a lot of time, nowadays, we can spare some time and uh, uh, make uh, all the trainees uh, learn this kind of approaches. And for that reason, uh, we have uh, added also the transorbital approach to the next course that we have in, uh, in Verona uh, next March. And uh, there will be a, a, an alpha day uh, of that session just for uh, With this, I have uh, finished, and uh, I want to thank you again, the uh, CNS, for the kind invitation to share uh, my experience. And uh, of course, uh, I will uh, be happy to answer all your questions or uh, now, of course, uh, live, and also if you want uh, to write me, these are my contacts. So thank you very much. Thank you for your nice presentation, Dr. Julia. You commented surgical to me, and you recommend the use of the steady strip to protect all this. And also you have to you recommend to, we have to respect the dress by brow in it to me. And I would like to ask some questions and then if you uh, when you, when you, we use the steady strip to close the eye, eye eyelid, and, and sometimes we need the pupil size during the operations, even and especially during the tumor. And can we take off the steady strip and then we need to uh, find the pupil size? Is it possible? Yeah, it is possible. We, we put uh, the, the steri strips uh, in a sterile uh, manner just uh, before to prepare the field. So uh, they are absolutely sterile and you can also, if necessary, uh, take away the steri strip easily or re-put other steri strips during the operation. Of course, if you use a lot of uh, irrigation of, or there is a bleeding, steri strip can uh, just uh, uh, become unuseful. And if necessary, you can always, especially if the operation uh, is very long or very difficult, you can always suture, of course, the, the, the eye. But I think that uh, it should remain a, a last option. Yeah, and instead of the, using the, I use the, the corneal protector to cover the cornea. Usually it's the, uh, the conventional observer community to do. And then we need to take off the corneal protector to find the precise. But then no one, I'm gonna try the, your technique to use the, the steri strip. And also I- Let I, me know if it works because you have- yeah. a, 
a huge experience. I, 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 I will be happy if a, a little tricks helps you. Yeah. And uh, I, I have another question. Uh, do you favor the eyebrow or so infra eyebrow the trends of the surgery? And then in my experience, it's very easy to find the back inside and then we easy to access the frontal at the same time to access the temporal side. The height of the incision is too high. It's very hard to get the temporal floor for my experience. And we need to uh, extend the superior eyelid uh, how uh, what 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 is your opinions about that yeah. is it any difficulties to get the base uh, you're, you're right it's not always easy uh, choose where to put the incision uh, uh, generally speaking is an infra eyebrow but it depends on the patient. And sometimes you can go a little bit lower or a little bit higher. And uh, the, the, the question is, if you need uh, a combined approach, of course, this incision is perfect. If there is uh, some bony works outside the orbit or in the frontal region, it's perfect. Uh, of course, if the uh, it's just an approach and you have to go through the dura, for example, an eyelid, it's maybe better for aesthetic results. So I think we should not be dogmatic. Uh, we should adapt, adapt our, uh, also the incision uh, to the patient and to the pathology, because you are totally right. It depends uh, if sometimes it's too high, sometimes it's too difficult to reach uh, the floor of the, the the roof of the orbit and so on. So mm -hmm. I, I I don't I don't I never say that my incision is the right one and the other is not good. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe it's the contrary. Maybe I'm wrong. And uh, I, I've tried uh, also the the eyelid. It's also feasible. It's a little, just a little bit more tricky to spare the elevator papillary muscle, but it's not a, a, a big big question of just five minutes works more. And uh, I think you should adapt your, your, uh, your trajectory from the skin to the patient. Yeah, I understand. And from the and Jude, there is a two questions about you to you. As so one question is, is about the uh, kind of chance of cavernous and operate uh, transfer approach and post -performance. And and also, is there any other advantages apart from the small incisions over microsurgery? Uh, I'm not sure because uh, the connection was not so perfect. Uh, um, which is the indication for a, a transnasal approach? I mean, or trans transorbital. Transorbital. Uh, in my opinion, the indication are all the pathology of the lateral part, superior or inferior of maybe, the orbit, maybe, yeah. uh, both intraconal and extraconal lesion, all the pathology of the orbital bony wall, the lateral part, and all the pathology, most of the cases are meningiomas, of course, of the sphenoid wings. Then, it should be uh, debate. There should be a debate about cavernous sinus lesion. You have a, a, a big experience on that, and uh, of uh, trigeminal schwannoma. We have read all your uh, wonderful article uh, of your case series, and uh, of course, uh, also there are, there are also some uh, uh, functional neurosurgery procedure that are. Uh, performed through the orbit. In this case, I'm not sure that is the right approach, but it's the same with the endoscopic transnasal. In the early 2000s, everyone wants to go transnasal. Also, for, for example, for huge uh, 
meningioma of the uh, anterior cranial fossa. And nowadays we step back. But uh, we, just, we just say that only tuberculum cell and meningioma are right for, maybe planum, right for an endoscopic approach. But all that works that has been done also for biggest meningioma helps us to gain a familiarity with the, the technique and uh, was necessary. I mean, when something new came into the field, should be stressed to the, mm, to the maximum. And then you have to step back a little bit and understand which is the right uh, indication for that approach. So I think we are uh, ongoing. Uh, it's an ongoing work in this kind of approach and we have to stress it more and more and to compare results with the gold standard. That's it. I see. This must be a bit of it. To be a pioneer for the new novel approach, I think. I agree with your opinions. Since the almost the same is, is the first one, how far posteriorly can we go to the in the middle cranial fossa? But, but I can answer that the middle cranial fossa tumors, trigeminal the Shubanuma, or dumbbell type of tumors. And nowadays, the brainstem, brainstem cavernomas can be accessed with the transoptal approach. It's almost the same as the anterior petrosal and the subdural, uh, subtemporal approaches. But yeah. Thank you for your nice presentation, Dr. Joya. And then- Thank you. And, uh, well, correct again, each other. And so, uh, the sessions lecture, uh, and over the next sessions, moderate. Well, we have uh, Ben who has raised his hand. Ben, Ben is of course working with Dr. Calvin Mack, who is also doing transorbital surgeries. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Hello. 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 Hello, Dr. Vajan. Can, can you hear me? Yes. And yeah, yeah. And hello, uh, Professor Kong again. And uh, glad to see you here just after the uh, Taiwan. And thank you, and Professor Asura, for sharing your transorbital uh, experience. And it's a very uh, new approach, uh, as uh, as as I learned. And uh, I just have a few quick uh, questions to uh, for for the sake of time. First. My first question is: uh, uh, what, what is the most common uh, incisions that uh, you use? And uh, my second question is about: uh, I saw you use the straw chip to close the um, uh, eyelid, uh, but during the surgery, uh, do you usually uh, check the uh, pupil uh, intermittently uh, to see the pupil size during the, uh, the during operation? And my uh, third uh, question is about uh, for those uh, bipotal cases or multi-portal cases uh, that uh, you perform, uh, usually what are the indications that uh, you will consider using a multi-portal uh, strategies? And do you find, uh, and also do you find uh, removing the uh, lateral orbital rim uh, uh, useful uh, in order to gain uh, more surgical freedom? And, uh, and nice to meet you all and uh, thank you so much for uh, answering my questions. Yeah, I... Thank you for the questions. Um, I use uh, the uh, lower eyebrow incision mostly, but uh, I know that uh, most of the surgeon use the superior eyelid incision. So I, I was, uh, these are the two main incisions that can be done. First uh, question. The second, I, I will not uh, go to see the pupils dur during the operation. Of course, uh, if there is... Uh, risk injuring the, the optic nerve or the third it's possible to just remove as said the steri strip see the pupil and reput it back it's not a big uh, a big deal for the multiportal uh, i think the uh, it depends from the um, from the lesion if the lesion cross the nerves for example is half in the lateral part and half in the medial part of the posterior orbit, I think, I think it's, it's not it's dangerous to use just a, an approach. 
And so I combined the, the two approach, transnasal, for example, and transorbital, and I reach just the middle part of the lesion, in that case uh, is the optic nerve, and, uh, I, I, and then I check from the other side in the, with, with the same uh, scope uh, where, I, where I am and wh what I can push from the nose, and take it out from the nose, and what I take it out from the, from the orbit. Uh, the same is uh, for, uh, for example, if I use a supraorbital approach and the lesion goes uh, uh, in the, the, toward the cavernous sinus or toward the chias. Uh, in that case, I will uh, check from the other perspective. Uh, I think that multiportal, it's a very good concept, but uh, of course, it's, it's not uh, uh, so common. So you have to uh, carefully um, see the images and understand if the lesion is just in one compartment, no problem. If the lesion is bigger or goes through the nerves, you have to consider a multiportal strategy. I hope I answer your question. Uh, Liu, any questions from you? Yeah, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor. Uh, very nice. Is, is it possible to use uh, fascia, lata, fascia lata for dura uh, uh, repair, especially those uh, with uh, dura opening? And then uh, uh, also a possibility is to do suturing. Is there any possibility to do suturing? And do you really need a lumbar drain uh, to, to reduce the risk of a CSF leakage? And uh, what additional informed consent that we needed uh, for extra coronal uh, lesion that we're using transorbital approach? Thank you, Professor. Uh, yes, uh, it, it's it's possible to use fascia lata. I, I I studied in Varese, so Professor Castelnuovo always use this kind of uh, closure technique, and I love fascia lata for closing uh, uh, the nose, of course. When, when there is the possibility also to, to make the other flap, it's mandatory to do that. Uh, but I think it's not always necessary to make another incision uh, in this case, because the orbit uh, helps you a lot in closure, because you have the pressure from the brain and the pressure from the orbit. And if you put also a heterologous material like uh, uh, all the stuff that are on the market, uh, with some fibrin glue, or uh, also uh, the fat of the orbit, if you cut a little bit, the periorbit can help you. And um, yeah, for extra coronal lesion, uh, um, you asked for uh, the standard uh, uh, coronaline uh, uh, craniotomy, uh, of course, can be done. But uh, also, I, I forget to answer also from the orbital rim portion if it's possible to, to do that. Uh, uh, yes, of course, it, it is possible, but it's not always necessary. Uh, I think if you could leave the frontal part of the bony of the orbit, aesthetically speaking, is perfect because you don't need to reconstruct. If you just take away the, the part that covers the uh, temporalis muscle, you don't need to reconstruct and you gain a lot of spaces and you have no, no incision uh, in the cron line, the standard, you, you do not have the standard cron line incision. So the body work uh, also that should be customized, I, I think. And in, in this case, uh, the navigation could help you a lot because it's just bone and this fixes, it's not, uh, uh, it's very, very precise, the navigator. Thank, thank you, Professor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful session and uh, I would like to thank both the speaker, Professor, uh, both, the, both the speaker, Dr. Zisare Zoya and Professor Lucy Kong for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. Uh, and uh, a special thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And as of now, we have around 370 people who have logged in through different uh, channels like YouTube, WeChat and Zoom. So we'll move directly onto the second session and I invite uh, Professor Salazar to give his lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate Professor Soya, an amazing 
a seminar, amazing images and a perfect surgical technique. Yeah, good morning to everybody. I would like to, to, to thank, first of all, uh, to Professor Yoko Kato, president of the ACNS and all the organizers of this fine event. And in this occasion, I would like to talk about the principles for meningioma surgery, because I think this is the kind of surgery that is the first pathology that residents want to operate. And it's one, one, one of the most gratifying when it's successful. And as a start, we have seen that Professor Al Mefti published in his book, all the main steps for meningioma surgery. You know, the four Ds, devascularization, detachment, debulking, dissection. And Professor Da Silva, his fellow, created the, this acronym, FIBER, as a five-step surgical strategy. And we all know as uh, Professor Lawton and Professor Martins, the number seven turned into a magic number for their collection of seven ABMs, aneurysm, and the anatomy, the rule of the orbit. And as I saw it, it could be easy just to add like three more steps to be included in this, in this group. But there are a lot of important steps for meningioma surgery that could have been left behind. So all these 17 steps, as I could say my own D for my own D rule for meningioma surgery can be applied to every meningioma. And it becomes like a good exercise to review the principles and the important steps and tricks, of course, of each meningioma type. So this will make the meningioma surgery a step-by-step -step surgery. And of course, it won't be uh, applicable for all meningiomas. And that's the beauty of this exercise, because I believe it's our duty to encourage the new generation of young surgeons, the fellows, uh, and the young surgeons to understand the disease and prepare in advance all the steps that are required for a successful meningioma surgery so we can try to avoid any improvisation during surgery. So our first step would be uh, the diagnostic radiology. So it's a necessary component of the workup of many germans. And as we know, the MRI with and without contrast is the gold standard for this diagnosis and evaluation of many germans. So it gets a lot of precise anatomic tumor location. And we can see the edema that might predict and increase tumor aggressivity and of course negative results. And we can also see the degree of encasement of the vessels, like in this case where the ICA can be displaced or totally encased by the tumor. For example, an angiomerai can give us information about the, the arterial branches that are involved in the tumor, as well as the venous drainage that is truly important to determine the number of tributaries that reach the sagittal sinus to evaluate the patency of the sinus and to visualize maybe the trolardal vein. So operative planning for past sagittal, falsing and tentorial meningiomas can be assisted by this MRI, uh, MRI venography. For example, the angio-CT can be useful when it correlates with 3D reconstructions to facilitate the understanding of the bone deformity and its blood supply. So for example, in this angio-CT, we can also show a, a See, this hyper, the hypertrophied superficial temporal artery supply in this outer portion of the tumor and the occipital arteries, like in this case. And we can identify the right meningeal artery, for example, in these other studies, where we can see the feeding of the central tumor tissue with this blushing and delayed retention of the contrast. So, for, for example, for facultatural meningiomas, this cerebral angiography is usually performed in all cases to evaluate the arterial supply of the tumor. The venous phase can be used as a gold standard to assess the patency, uh, principally of the straight sinus. And we can see here, for example, in this DCA, how the gallon vein and the straight sinus are partially infiltrated, but still patent. So we can see, for example, an inferior displacement of the internal cerebral bear, as you can see here, and a decreased collateral venous drainage. For example, another a useful a study is the CT scans that provide us information about the extent of bone involvement that is not well appreciated on MRI, like hyperostosis, like in this case, or maybe osseous destruction. So for example, intralational calcification is the most significant predictable factor of slow tumor growth. We know that hyperostosis of adjacent school it's highly suggestive of a benignant geoma. And for sure, the removal of hyperostatic bones 
provides a more complete recession and leads to a lower rate of recurrence. Our next step would be the DCA devascularization, referring to an early preoperative embolization. And we all know that the debate concerning preoperative embolization of meningiomas continues because we know it has some advantages, like can induce necrosis, inflammation, and free window changes, softens the tumor, there is less operative bleeding, and of maybe a shortened surgical time. But we know also that has a lot of disadvantages. And even though the main indications for embolization are ECA dominant blood supply, no clinically or statistically significant difference between blood loss, operative duration, gross total resection, postoperative complication, and even postoperative mortality are available. So we all know that some contraindications for these procedures are dangerous ECA, ICA anastomosis, some presence of feeders, maybe that can occlude the flow in the ICA. We can have the eye hydrocephalus, some even revascularization through the collateral blood supply. And of course, we see here, there are large tumors that invade the bone that have large hypertrophied feeders that maybe are not reachable for, air, for an early coagulation after the craniotomy. So in these cases, maybe it will be useful to use a preoperative embolization. Of course, there are some controversies regarding the material, the size of the particles, and the timing for embolization. Our next step would be drain. That means the lumbar drain. It is recommended in some cases, like in these parasagital meningiomas, or maybe posterior fossa meningiomas, facotendral meningiomas. However, the lumbar drain should be opened simultaneously when opening the door, especially in posterior fossa tumors, to avoid risk of foraminal herniation. And of course, this is a practice that nowadays maybe in most centers, uh, it's not longer useful. Uh, our next step would be disposition, referring to the patient position. This patient, for example, should be positioned, or the patient should be positioned to allow the surgeon to work ergonomically in a comfortable position. So I always tries to use the gravity for our advantage. So at least for my practice for parasagital, fox meningiomas, you can position the patient in a lateral or park bent position, especially for older patients, short neck patients, obese patients, and always with the size of the tumor downwards. As, a, as an alternative, for example, there have been some reports about a Professor Spetzler group that, that they position the patient, for example, with these fox meningioma, the small fox meningioma, with the patient uh, containing the lesion on the upside of the surgical field, like in this case, with the head flexed 45 degrees upwards. And they managed to do resect the fumor through the fox. And as we see here in the pictures of this um, a, a special collection video, Maybe uh, that's an approach that I wouldn't use, but uh, I guess it's, uh, it's fine that we can see that there are many options to treat uh, any kind of tumors. For example, for these large orofotory groove meningiomas, the patient is positioned supine with head in the neutral position and extended so the frontal lobes can fall away from the anterior school base. For small orofotory groove meningiomas, maybe less than three centimeters, we can use and just uh, Rotate the head patient 15 to 20 degrees toward the contralateral side of the tumor. The next slide deflects and titolaterally. And this position, for example, is useful to make a supraorbital lateral approach, like it's promoted from Professor Yuha. Yeah, maybe for convexity meningiomas, you know, the, the key thing would be to put the shoulder of the dependent hemisphere with uh, support with a large bolster. So the head is rotated according to the location of the lesion and avoid compression of the venous uh, veins. Uh, we have seen here as a great masters like Professor Sami, Tatajiva, Leal, Campero, and so many others, uh, they have shown us that for very big meningiomas, uh, posterior fossa meningiomas, the semi seat position is an advantage because the surgical field is always clean because of gravity, but it requires experience and anesthesiologists to detect air embolism, uh, and for the surgeon, at least, it's very hard because he has to work with the outstretched arms and this is exhausting. This is not an ergonomical position. 
And for the other hand, the other hand, for small tumors, like in this case, that can be placed uh, in a conventional supine position, rotating the head, and as the sagittal suture is parallel to the floor. So this is a position that is more comfortable for the surgeons and it has no risk of air embolism. Our next step would be look, uh, drawing, referring to the incision. And we have to know that there are main steps for planning an incision that are performed wide incisions and cutanean flaps to avoid excessive edge retractions, to, prefer, to preserve your myofascia and pericranial structures, and of course, preservation of the vascularization and cutaneous nerves. So we have to know that the incision must preserve both superficial and vascularization of the skull, and of course, it's all its innervation, mainly the anterior and lateral and posterior groups. Of course, we know that the bicoronal incision is useful to reach unilateral or bilateral front basal portions to treat, for example, olfatory groove meningiomas. And we know that a more posterior place in skin incision facilitates to harvesting a longer pericranial flap. Of course, we know that this bicoronal incision can be straight, can be cured, it doesn't matter. The important thing is to release the supraorbital nerve from the orbital ring. When we do a question mark incision, like in this case, it's used to access the temporal lobe, including the tip of maybe used to gain access to the middle and posterior temporal lobes, depending how uh, far you go behind. And the key thing is that the base of the incision should be wide enough and we should try to preserve both temporal and uh, superficial arteries. And of course, it is useful to, to approach different sizes meningiomas. For example, a C or horseshoe incision should have a base that is twice the height, uh, twice the size of the height, so we can avoid ischemia. And in this case, for example, for avoid for fox meningiomas, this skin incision should be carried and cross the midline so that the superior sagittal sinus may be exposed over the length and the bone flap allowing to mobilize the sinus. We can use a vertical line incision that involves less trauma to overlying muscles. Maybe it's easier to get watertight closure. And it's useful for these small lesions, like in these cases, where there is no need maybe to do a, do a big duroplasty. So the linear incision may be simply extended superiorly or just inferiorly if needed. So it is easier to execute. But we have seen different types of incision that can be applied, for example, to the retrosic approach. We have the C incision, that this curved incision allows a limited soft tissue retraction compared with a linear incision. So it reduces chronic development of uh, fibrosis, the scars. It reduces occipital neuralgia. Uh, maybe you cannot use or you don't need to use some self-retraining retractors, and maybe it can reduce ischemia. So the degree of manipulation and of the surgical instrument in this study was compared between a linear incision and this curvilinear incision. And uh, what we saw in this, in this uh, report is that the folded myocutlinus flap that we see here in obese patients, when we do a linear incision was more problematic because it limits the, your, your, your range of motion of the instruments. So it is recommended for this kind of patient that are more obese or harbor a substantially thicker skull flap that we use, that we use a semicircular uh, incision. And of course, we have also this modified U um, reverse incision that is used by Professor Adam Cohen Gadol. And we have a different kinds of incisions. We have the hockey incisions for cerebral hemisphere or CP angles where you know, getting the muscles out of the way with facility with, uh, maneuvering of the instruments. And of course, combine post auricular C uh, shape incision. But the thing is that we have to preserve the facial branches when we perform an incision. And according to this article published by Campero, he describes the zygomatic fascial triangle, which is formed by the upper border of the zygoma anterior to the tragus and 26 millimeters below and 18 in front. So in this triangle, it's a safe dissection zone when there is no uh, 
branches of the fashion layer. So if you get like in this case, outside this triangle, you are going to have a damaged facial nerve and a patient with a lot of deficits. The next step would be the design, referring as a decraniotum. We can do bar holes that can be placed uh, over the sagittal sinus, or they can be placed uh, at each side of the sagittal sinus. The bone flap, it could be done in one piece or maybe staged in two pieces. This is helpful because it allows us to dissect the dura overlying the sinus from the bone and crossing the midline to the contralateral hemisphere. And of course, the exposure of the craniotomy should be for at least three centimeters around the margins of the tumor. In some cases, like parasurgical meningiomas, the craniotomy should cross the midline, you know, maybe two or three centimeters, so we can expose the sinus, mobilize it. Or in a, like in other cases, we can do just a small craniotomy where there is a, a, we expose just the border of the sinus, two or three centimeters. And of course, to avoid any venous lesion. If we are to, to do any bifrontal craniotomy after elevating the bone flap, we know, know that we have to do the frontal sinus treatment, demycolize it, cranialize it, and of course, opening the door. We know that the elevation of the bone flap can be complicated by the engorged deployed anastomosis, like in these cases, and by invasion of the bone by the tumor. So in some uh, severe tumor-induced hyperostosis, we can see here that the craniotomy flap, the flap can be placed around the tumor by placing multiple bar holes, connecting them by rungers, skirts, and punches, and of course, a central bone of the portion can be attached and left to the tumor. But we can also have smaller lesions, deeper lesions, like this intraventricular meningioma. So we can use craniometric pollens confirmed with neurodamigation, and we can plan a smaller craniotomy to reach, for example, this uh, sample, the intraparietal sulcus, to approach the lesion, and we could achieve a uh, gross total resection, and the patients uh, have no uh, major neurological deficits. Our next step would be drilling. And we know that for many meningioma surgery, we need to drill the bone to get to the tumor. And of course, we have seen this in clinellum in German, because when the craniotomy is established, we proceed with the extradural work that leads to the removal of the anterior clinoidal process. And after that, uh, after the clinoidal, uh, clinoidectomy, we have to unroof the optic canal that is drilled, that is decompressed. And of course, the dura layer of the optic canal is open along the optic nerve and exposing the tumor and uh, taking it out. Of course, for a vestibular schonoma with a auditory canal invasion, we have to first drill the posterior wall up to the fundus and identify the intracranial portion of the tumor, proceed to resect from lateral to median, of course, taking care of the seven and eight cranial nerves. We need to know that for a school-based approaches like a clival, petroclival meningiomas, we have to drill different portions of the petrous bone, such as the anterior or posterior petrosectomy, so maybe both. So it is important to use, when drilling, a lot of saline to avoid heat lesion. Uh, we have to have a lot of different size of the drills, three, two, and one millimeter drills. The next step will be the devascularization, referring to the early transoperative devascularization. This is, for example, known that early interruption of the blood supply is critical in minimizing blood loss during tumorization. So during, for example, this uh, parafalcin meningioma or small meningioma, the early devascularization can be achieved opening first the interhemispheric fissure and to gain access to the base of the tumor adjacent to the fox. So for large meningiomas, for example, more than five centimeters, the dissection maybe it's initiated, it's initiated at lateral margins. And of course, we have to be careful of the pericolosal or the colossal marginal branches that supply the inframedial aspect of the lesion. And remember that these lesions can also have feeders from the middle meningeart, middle cerebral arteries. As we saw, as we spoke a little bit before, spinal meningiomas receive their main arterial supply from the accessorial meningeal arteries. Uh, or the middle, uh, the middle uh, meningeal arteries. So 
to get an early devascularization, we can use these extradural approaches of the anterior uh, middle cranial fossa. So this allows us to identify, like in this case, uh, the, the temporal base. We can see the dura, we can coagulate these arteries before it even touch the tumor. So as we see here in this picture of Professor Campero, the dura matter is well coagulated. And of course, all the this bleeding of the tumor will come uh, maybe to maybe zero. So that's one of the things that, for example, these um, approaches differ a, a lot from, for example, what you just seen through the orbit, that we can have these early devascularization approaches and avoid a, a lot of bleeding. For example, in convexity meningiomas, we can coagulate these hypertrophy and tortoise branches of the meningeal arteries that perform easily after the craniotomy. A, a final meningiomas, of course, uh, get the blood supply from the posterior and moidal branches, some anterior dural branches also from the menin, a middle meningeal artery, sometimes also the meningeal orbital artery. So to devascularize these lesions, we have to start by uh, cutting the meningeal orbital band, and we can go extra durally to explore the anterior clinoid process and dissect, coagulate the pretemporal dura, and of course the subfrontal dura away from the spinal wing, significantly devascularization in the tumor. Uh, in olfactory groove meningiomas, we know that conventional angiography it's really it's really used because the major feeding vessels like the anterior or posterior and modal arteries can be surgical divider early in the procedure. And that is why the symbolization almost is never needed or maybe technically, technically impossible. Our next step would be the durotomy. Uh, we can found in this uh, classic paper that there are nodules of one and up to three centimeters from the site of the attachment of the meningioma. And that is why we need to have a wide surgical incision. So the dura should be, a, a, be incised around the tumor with a two centimeter margin from the contrast enhancing component of the lesion. So the dura is coagulated and resect with the tumor. In parasurgical meningiomas, we can open the dura in a semilunar uh, fashion along the sagittal sinus that is elevated, uh, preferably under microscope and direct visualization to avoid any PL damages. We can do also in very big tumors, we can perform a small limited dural opening, like in this case, over the top of the tumor to avoid the protrusion of an of a, a, a edematous brain and parenchyma and start bulking the tumor. And of course, we can use and we should use cottonoids when uh, opening the dura to protect the normal brain. There are a few variations to open the dura in the retrosig approach. It can be uh, open in a semicircular fashion. It can be open in a straight line fashion like Professor Tatajiva or Campero or Professor Sami like to do it. Or we can do it uh, outside the venous sinuses with a diagonal cut to the junction of the transverse segment sinuses. Uh, the next step would be the delimitation. Uh, I know and we all know that during um, initial dissection, we try to identify the presence or the absence of an arachnoidal plane between the main ingioma and the tumor and the, uh, and the brain and the adjacent tissue. So in this um, Fox meningioma, tumor removal begins with the coagulation and section of the tumor to the Fox, as we know, as we have said a lot. And then the next thing will be the disassemble. That means the art of breaking the tumor. And we know that in some cases, there are huge meningiomas that protrude the bone. So this extra cranial component needs to be addressed first. Afterwards, the capsule is coagulated to decrease the tumor to, the, to, to a, a, a small size. And of course, uh, to leave it to the uh, margin of the craniotomy. And of course, in these cases, we have to avoid resection in block that may lead to cerebral damages. We can find some calcified tumors that you have to break it down in a piecemeal fashion using sharp blades with traction and contra-traction maneuvers. Our next step will be the debulking. And we know that for lesions bigger than three centimeters, 
the internal debulking with ultrasonic aspiratum must be performed to facilitate the dissection of the tumor capsule. <clears throat> of a, following the internal debulking, we can proceed in a semicircular fashion, alternating from lateral to medial until we get to the deeper portion of the lesion. We can do this debulking with scissors, with blades to initiate the debulking. And this is how we should aim to have our cavity before starting to, to do the arachnoidal section. Another way to debug the tumor is to use the carotary burners, uh, where, I, where I think that it's not uh, any more used, but you know, it has been described, it was used before. The next uh, step would be the arachnoidal dissection. So in this video from the Alneftic collation, we can see here how the arachnoid plane must be preserved and must be maintained such that the arachnoid is dissected from the tumor and not from the vein. So with this peeling away movement, we try to leave the arachnoid as close to the brain uh, parenchyma instead of cutting it here, just to pull it away from the tumor with distraction and contraction maneuvers. And in parasagittal meningiomas or Fox meningiomas, this bringing veins must be preserved in the intermispheric uh, feature, feature. So also in this uh, video, we can see the uh, Sujita Kobayashi maneuver that is tried that it is uh, to dissect the vein from the, uh, from the underlying cortex so they can be uh, free and mobile, allowing a safe mobilization so we can go into the intermispheric uh, feature, feature. So Professor Almefti does it, and we, of course, try to replicate for our cases. Uh, if the tumor has violated the pial surface, we can use gentle dissection with bipolar coagulation to try to separate the capsule from the brain tissue. And we have to know that the meningiomas without an arachnoid plane of dissection and PL invasion might be associated with more complications and may have a different cure rates and a worse outcome. And of course, in sometimes in many cases, we can coagulate the capsule to shrink it and to mobilize uh, it uh, in a manner, in an easier fashion. There are some reports to the vacuum assisted in block resection technique that can be done in medium to large meningiomas, and especially in the convex meningiomas. A water dissection technique, as seen in this video from the collection of Professor Yuha, it's a very inexpensive, simple, effective method to create a cleavage plane between the extraparenchymal masses and the adjacent brain. Of course, if we don't have this kind of technology, we can use some irrigation system, you know, do it manually, try to find the arachnoidal plane, to fill it with sal to saline, and to try to create a plane so we can do this arachnoidal dissection. Of course, we can use a stitch uh, through the tumor to mobilize it, and the tumor capsule is separated always from the brain, respecting the arachnoid plane towards the resection cavity. And this uh, capsule can be shrinked in attempt to identify the neurovascular structures. And mobilization, we have to keep it uh, and avoid uh, mobilizing it through uh, eloquent areas or maybe uh, cranial nerves. Our next step will be look, uh, what I call the disconnection. That means in block versus spinal meal. And we know that disconnection from the neurovascular structure is mandatory. In clinodal meningiomas, we have to separate it from the arachnoidal plane, separate it from the ICA, use sharp dissection, try to avoid uh, any, sacri uh, any, any coagulation or sacrifice uh, any vessel. And of course, it is said that in block resection, removal may, may be appear to be lesser bleeding and shorter operative times. But what have we seen? that for lesions more than three centimeters, if we try to remove the lesion in block, it requires a lot of manipulation of the adjacent parenchyma. So we can have ischemia, we can have epileptic sutures. If we use, we have to avoid trying to use our fingers to dissect the meningioma. And we, as we see here, this aggressive manipulation to get the meningioma in one piece will leave you with a well-traumatized parenchyma and a huge cavity. 
Of course, the piecemeal resection is mandatory in situations when you can't do ad block procedures. That means a uh, small tumors or very big tumors that you have to uh, cut it in a, in a piecemeal fashion. So this technique allows less manipulation of the brain, allows to localize and visualize the nerves to protect them. And of course, we can use a lot of microsurgical techniques, uh, try to avoid any, any bipolar coagulation of uh, uh, near vessels, near nerves. And some samples, for example, of the piecemeal uh, technique would be these petrochlival or clival meningiomas. The next step would be the dura implantation. And we know that tumor cell infiltration of the dura is quite common in maybe two thirds of the cases. So to accomplish a complete resection of the dura tray, the craniotomy should be two centimeters larger than the durotomy. And the durotomy should be two to three centimeters from the dural tail. But that means like in this case, if you have this meningioma, this convexity meningioma that has significantly the need of a larger craniotomy because you see that the dural tail is farther, is more, is more um, anterior and posterior than the center of the tumor. So you need to plan your durotomy regarding this extensions of the dural tail. So that means that for this patient, that as you see here, it comes right to maybe the temporal uh, anterior uh, portion. So you will have to plan a bigger craniotomy, a bigger durotomy, and a bigger incision. So you can actually do a Simpson grade one resection. And the recurrence of folks, many germans is related to the diffuse presence of tumor between the leaflets of the folks, so an increased extended resection of the folk surroundings of the tumor base when possible was associated with best outcomes, less recurrency, and this is what Professor Al Mefti called the great zero resection. As we see here, some schematics from the neurosurgical atlas, we can see how the tentorial surfaces uh, can be coagulated and later resected, as well as the facotentorial meningiomas whenever possible to, to try to recurrence these lesions. Next step would be the duroplasty. So regarding duroplasty, it can be done with pericranium, which is my favorite uh, thing to use, fascia lata, fascia temporalis, a bovine pericardium of synthetic dura. So we should try to do a watertight road closure that is important, especially for patients with residual disease or high rate lesions uh, that maybe we'll do right in third. Uh, of course, for these petrochlorine germans, it's not possible to do duroplasty, so we need to perform this vascularized galeofacial flap that this can be directed uh, to cut uh, lengthwise so that the tip of the flap can reach the, uh, the petrous apex. And we can rotate this uh, vascularized pedicle pericardial flap that were harvested and, of course, later use some surgical ambiguity. Uh, just the final step would be uh, deformity, which means bone defect and cranioplasty. So it is fundamental to have all the different materials to perform a cranioplasty if our intent is to make a Simpson one resection. So cranioplasty can be made with titanium mesh, peak, uh, methyl metacrylate, and of course, all affect bone must be discharged. Uh, just to finish some clinical cases, uh, as we presented before, for example, this 50-year-old patient with a um, middle third meningioma, Fox meningioma. So we apply this all these 17 steps to elaborate a game plan before surgery to treat this meningioma. And the main thing for this patient was the position, that it was placed in the lateral position, but I tilted 15 degrees upwards the, the head. Why? Because I wanted to have a better angle of attack to the fox and to try to perform a great zero removal. If we should have left it in zero uh, degrees, maybe the, our vision wouldn't be so optimal. And as Professor Spessler reported in his cases, to tilt it 45 degrees, uh, at least for me, it was not necessary. It has some risk of venous uh, compression, high edema, edema cerebral edema. So I guess it's not necessary, just a little bit of tilt and to, 
uh, do an anti train position, it's quite enough. So we perform the usual parasagilal craniotomy. In this case, because of this position, this tilted head, uh, there was no need to expose the sagittal sinus, just two, three millimeters, and to perform the duotomy and early devascularization, attacking the fox, as we have discussed it. The debulking of the lesion, the little delimitation, uh, this position guarantees that you don't need to have any, any, any serial retractor. I'm sorry. And finally, after removing the tumor, the coagulation of the fox uh, uh, to have a margin, a uh, safety margin was cut as high and as low as possible to achieve a great zero resection, like Professor Almefti told us. He, when you see here in the pre op and post op with a patient uh, asymptomatic and with a good evolution. Uh, another case, a 44 year old female patient that debuted with focal seizures with episodes of sensor, uh, sensory dysphagia. So we can see here a left parietal convexity meningioma, which compressed the Wernicke area. So a large dural tail in this case was like this is appreciated and extends outside the tumor implantation. And of course, we see some dural uh, calcification, some bone hyperostosis. We applied the say in, once again, the 17 steps rule for this meningioma surgery. We position our patient in the usual manner. We, we use narrow navigation, especially to mark the anterior and posterior limits of the dural chain. That was the key feature of this meningioma because we can know how far the extension of our skin should be. So actually we can have a gross total with margins, duotomy, and avoid recurrence. We perform the usual craniotomy, the dissection of, the, uh, of this part of meningioma that was uh, adjacent to the bone. Of course, uh, the coagulation of these hypertrophied and tortoise branches of the meningal uh, arteries that were performed easily after the craniotomy. A big durotomy was made, and I'm sorry. Uh, this big durotomy was made, and the tumor was debulked and separated you know, in the usual manner, respecting the aeronoidal plane. And of course, in this case, we can do a gross total Simpson 1 resection, and a big duroplasty was performed afterwards. Also, a craniotomy around uh, the invading oceans uh, bone was done. And of course, it was covered with some uh, titanium mesh. Uh, once again, the, we see the pre-op and the post-op patient without any deficit, uh, new, new neurological deficit. Uh, another case, uh, very quickly, this was a 70-year-old patient who was diagnosed with a small left lesion since two, uh, 2015. And that has not changed significantly in seven years. And he's asymptomatic. So the main thing of this is that we have to always to understand that the natural history of the disease before deciding any treatment. And we operate on patients and not images. And sometimes the best treatment is not is not is, is to observe and not to have surgery. And in these reports, in this analysis, the meta-analysis, it was concluded that a volume, a volume change of more than 2.1 centimeters a year was the strongest indicator of symptomatic progression of the patient. And younger age, absence of calcifications, T2 hyperintensity were associated with faster tumor growth velocity, but greater radiological progression but not symptomatic patient progression. And uh, to finalize, uh, this other patient is uh, a nice case because this patient came for a second assessment from another institution. Uh, he had mild headaches without any neurological deficit. And they came to, to know a small incidental anterior floral meningioma that was evident in his MRI. Uh, and the, the colleague uh, suggested surgery for this meningioma. So uh, he had um, some things that we can discuss. This patient had a report that this neurosurgeon read, and this lesion was described, first of all, as like a parasitical meningioma, which is completely wrong because it's anterior school-based meningioma. 
Surgery was indicated even though the patient was asymptomatic, without any evidence of radiological tumor growth, with extremely small lesion. Of course, the patient did not accept the surgery, but instead of that, the patient was proposed to do radio surgery. So uh, as a conclusion of this case of what, sh what, what we shouldn't do, you know, first of all, we cannot trust the radiological reports. That means that you have to assess your image yourself. We cannot indicate surgery if we don't know the natural history of the lesion. And as Professor Almefti has taught us, giving radio surgery to lesion is not the solution because there are a lot of risks of possibility of radio-induced meningiomas. So uh, as a conclusion and message to young neurosurgeons, it is always important to develop a work plan, methodically analyze every case and carry out a step-by-step -step surgery that can be reproduced in all cases before the surgery. So I would like to invite you to our International Congress in Quito, Ecuador. This will be done from March 12 to 15. We have a selected group of international speakers that are willing to come. And of course, I would like to extend this invitation to this group of panelists and Professor Yoko Kato, that it will be very nice to have you with us here in Ecuador. We have a lot of food. We have the Galapagos Islands that are amazing. And of course, we will love to see you here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture, Professor. Salazar and a great teaching source for all the young neurosurgeons who will be listening to this webinar. So uh, if we can open this for discussion, any questions from you, my co-host Liu Gunseng? Thanks, thanks Raja. Thanks uh, Professor Salazar for a very nice uh, comprehensive uh, lecture on the meningioma. I have two questions, uh, Professor. Uh, I, I, I wanted to know that uh, uh, by performing angiogram, uh, would you be able to identify uh, a branch of ICA that's supplying the intracranial meningioma uh, that, that we can actually uh, 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 mean, uh, sacrifice it intraoperatively? Because the, the issue is uh, sometimes uh, supplying from the branch of ICA is much difficult for us to, to think whether should we sacrifice it or should we uh, try to look the end of the vessel. So can the angiogram pre-op help us uh, in 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 doing in doing so uh, uh, for for that for that reason and uh, my my second question uh, professor uh, in in you mentioned that uh, some some cases that they, they have a uh, uh, poor poor margin no arenoid plane and and uh, sometimes infiltrate uh, to the uh, brain parenchyma would those cases that you will push for early HPE histopathological uh, result. Because in generally, we don't actually push for early HPE for meningioma. So would those cases, uh, you make a different uh, management? Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I guess um, what we can and, and we always try to do is the first surgery, uh, the, the most surgery, the most... Uh, we try to, to, to do the, the, the best surgery, the first surgery, the best surgery. You know, that is always the, the aim. So we kind of try to, to take a Simpson one recession, but as you said, sometimes they can be a um, part of the ICA or some bills that you know that you won't be able to, to, to touch, that you have a lot of risk of uh, damaging or occluding and all the ischemic um, um, features that you may have. So I guess the, the good sense means that if you know that you can have it all, you need to leave it. You can use the, the echo, no, the, the, the ultrasound to see, to maybe see some of the vessels. Uh, we have used, for example, a ICG during surgery to maybe try to follow the, the, um, the main trunk of the vessel and see where it goes down, where it disappears and try to see if we can actually follow it. But if we know that it's too, too, too deep, that it has a lot of risk of rupture, we, we might just leave it. We try to, to take as much as we can, but we should leave it a little bit inside it and, you know, radio surgery, gamma knife, whatever. And just to see, of course, uh, the first, our, the first um, point of view will be if the tumor is going to grow, so to watch the natural history. 
So maybe you can take 90%, the patient is asymptomatic with no neurological deficit, has a good quality of life, and you can follow the, the, the residual tumor for many years, and maybe in some point of your life, you will be that it's increasing the, the size, and maybe you can afterwards send it to, to gamma knife. One more additional question, Professor. If those meningioma diagnosed with MRI, uh, first first time, uh, how was the necessity to have a CT scan? If so, in what cases? Thank you, Professor. No, I, I actually performed the, the CT scan in all cases. Yeah, it's like a, a, a routine that we do because we actually want to see if the patient has, has hyperptosis and as uh, I told, the, the prognostic factor, no, if he has like intra-calcified intra intra lesions, calcified in, uh, lesions inside the, the tumor of the, and also uh, the, the 3D scans, I guess it's very important to see the bone, to plan the, the cranioplasty. So I do all the, in all my cases, at least I do MRI, I do CT scan, I do the angio, the MRI, angio, arterial, and, and venous uh, phases in all cases. What I, what I sometimes did was the DCA procedure, you know, a, a panangiography, but, you know, nowadays, a, I guess I almost, a few selected cases, I'm, I'm doing the, the, the angiography, and I guess the preoperative embolization is something that I have stopped doing for a long time. You know, as we can see that we can do an early preoperative uh, coagulation of the vessels. So I have changed that part of my of my daily practice. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Yes, I too agree with Professor uh, Salazar that sometimes uh, the procedure of uh, pre-op embolization may not be necessary. But sometimes in meningiomas with the hypervascularity, you may not be like... Uh, I have seen patients exsanguinating to death in while craniotomy while doing such hypervascular meningioma. So it is like our preoperative investigations should aim at detecting this hypervascularity. And uh, as this point of hypervascularity has come up, uh, one interesting article came up from uh, uh, from Turkey in 2016 regarding intraoperative ethyl alcohol injection into the meningioma to devascularize the tumor. I think it is also a very important adjunct if in case you miss that it is not so vascular tumor but intraoperatively you find this uh, so I think it's a very important just to complement it just to complement that there are you know we used to do it like to use a, a hydrogen peroxide inside the tumor to just inject it a little bit try to make it a, to, to wait a few seconds and then try to to take the tumor out yeah, it's a nice tactic, you know, but we have to know that the peroxide, the hydroperoxide, it's not a sterile solution. And it can cause like micro microembolization you know, of the brain parenchyma. So uh, as you said, in some cases where, you know, you can't uh, stop the bleeding, maybe you have to use all these strategies to try to to preserve the patient. And of course, if you can, you have to leave it there. Another is like you showed the excision of dural tail, which extends. It was a small manager, but, but the tail extended far more posteriorly and laterally. So uh, I don't think that in contemporary practice, many would do such an extensive large craniotomy and resect the dural tails. But uh, the long term results of such uh, residual dural tails have to be determined in larger studies. Uh, do you always resect the tails in uh, basal meningiomas also? Because it's difficult yeah, in, to in, in school based meningiomas. No, I, in school based, we know that we actually can do a, a neurotomy in some cases. You might coagulate it, you know, make a Simpson 2, maybe Simpson 3 at, at the most. So in those cases, when I, well, what I try is to coagulate as far as, uh, as much as I can. If I can drill something about it, I will drill it also, you know, using a lot of saline to avoid any heat lesion. And uh, for me, it, it is the good sense that we have to keep quality of life. So if I'm going to try to take it and take it and take it and take it and have the risk to lesion any cranial nerve, uh, 
maybe some retraction, ischemia. So I would prefer to leave it behind and to follow clinically. So um, when I can, you know, I can coagulate as far as I can, maybe drill, but, you know, I won't fight against take the, the last piece of the tumor out or the bone out. Then. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. If there are any questions from Dr. Cesar Ezoia, would you like to say something? Just a quick comment, if I can. I think we, we should add uh, another D. So 18D, not 17. The, the, the D that I, I suggest is devices. Because it's very important to have all the devices you have to have. For example, endoscope, exoscope that could help you in positioning or navigation system sometimes, or CUSA, or all the stuff that we use. Of course, it's, it's a normal thing that an neurosurgeon should have devices, but it's very important to, to, to plan and to know what you need. But just uh, just for joking, but could be another D. No. Thank you. Thank you. It, it will be 18. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Well, thank, thank you. you thank very you very much. The devices also need expertise for using those devices. So it is also important. So I think we had a wonderful discussion. And thank you, Professor Salazar, for this uh, excellent teaching session for the young neurosurgeons. With that, we can uh, wind up now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Prof. Sipu Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Dr. Cesar Ezoia and Prof. Brian Salazar, as well as the Chair, Prof. Dusik Kong, for this time and support for the ACNS webinars. A special thanks to my, uh, our Vice President, Prof. Shubin, for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And as of now, we have around 370 people who have logged in on all the streaming platforms. So until we all meet online on the 17th of December, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.